like if someone you know steals a car the police is not going to come to their house and steal their car so we don't apply this principle for everything we only hi i'm Ezekiel. and i am andy and this is the accented philosophy podcast brought to you by dailyphilosophy.com Every Tuesday, we discuss and explain the deeper issues behind the news so that you can understand the real problems and make better decisions in your own life. So, hello, my name is Andy. And I'm Ezekiel. And today we talk about the death penalty. Yeah, so the discussion um, is based on this article that was recently published um, about the fact that some pharmaceutical companies, especially Pfizer, which is uh, now uh, famous, um, have decided not to provide the US with the, the drugs that are usually used for the injection for death penalty because it's not aligned with their moral principles. And as a result, the prisons have to um, execute prisoners in a different way and they're being prisoners are being given the choice between firing squad or the electric chair um so i think here there's a couple of problems first we could wonder whether this kind of choice is okay is it cruel to present a prisoner with this kind of choice also we may wonder if there is a way of killing someone that is worse than another maybe also more cruel and then makes the whole process of death penalty less morally acceptable we may wonder if death penalty is also morally acceptable or in the first place and then also the responsibility of the drug companies can they actually decide not to provide the drug and interfere with this process that has nothing to do with them and the way they are run Right. Or even other countries. There were even some countries uh, that said that the European Union, for example, said that they don't want to export these drugs to the United States. And we can ask, is this an interference into the uh, internal decisions of the United States on how to execute their prisoners? Exactly. So I think this raises the question of is it different to decide to withdraw from something you disagree with as a state or as a company than to directly intervene in another country's decisions? Yes, but um, is there really a difference? I mean, uh, every country needs uh, various components, uh, various raw materials in order to be able to function. And taking away these raw materials uh, is a kind of embargo, right? It's a kind of, of blocking this country from access to what it needs in order to function in a particular area. And so it seems that uh, not giving the European Union, not giving the United States what they need in order to um, execute their laws uh, is is a kind of interference, right? So we take away from the government of the United States their ability to perform the death penalty. Um, would you think that this is a problem? So I think, well, obviously it has to do with this, this principle of non-intervention, right? Typically countries all accept the idea that they should be sovereign when it comes to their own internal affairs. So if the US wants to have death penalty, they can have death penalty. The international community should not have anything to do with that and should not intervene. So then it's a little different when it comes to another country's supply. You could argue that this supply is owned by the country or the company and that as a consequence they are entitled to the use of this supply and so in this if we agree on this then there would not be an issue in simply keeping the supply for themselves even if as a result it has consequences on the way the other country would um, proceed 
Right, but but then we could extend this. This doesn't need to be limited to drugs for executions. We could extend this and we could say, then we also try to influence the politics um, of the United States by not exporting other things that they need, right? Or not cooperating in their space program and uh, not exporting um, any ingredients that they need in order to build uh, computers or rockets. So you can actually then force, especially smaller countries, I mean, with the United States is perhaps a bad example because this is a country that is big enough and has its own resources often. <clears throat> but if you have smaller countries, you could in this way really steer their policies and uh, their development by just uh, strategically withdrawing resources from them. Would this not become immoral at some point? You would, and, and especially since we have to consider that um, there, there is, there has been a decision-making process in the United States in favor of the death penalty. So it's not only uh, doing something crazy, the United States doing something crazy for no good reason, but they're ac actually executing the will of their population, which has been determined in a, we assume, democratic way. And so now we are interfering with this democratic process. Wouldn't we have to respect that? So the democratic aspect is interesting. In fact, um, we may wonder if we need to respect a country's wish to do something only if it is a democratic country. So does the democratic aspect of a decision gives absolute legitimacy to this decision? And therefore, sh should we all respect it, even if we would disagree with it, or if our state would democratically, democratically decide that this is not what we want to do. Um, I don't know. Or do we just have to respect the sovereignty of any country, regardless of their, the kind of system they, they're using? So if a country is not democratic, do you think then their decisions can be questioned and that then we would be justified in our um, um, refusal to provide the supplies they need? Do you think that makes a difference? Yeah, this brings us to this question of relativism again, right? Do we, yeah. do we think that uh, whatever other countries or other cultures do is equally valuable and equally good and justifiable? Or do we think that we have some privileged access to truth about moral issues? Um, this seems problematic, right, to say that we have some insight into what is good or bad that other countries don't have, and therefore we are justified in forcing them to do things our way. So to assume that the European Union, for example, has an insight into the morality of uh, the death penalty, which the United States don't have, and therefore we can force them to uh, embrace uh, the European Union's um, practices. This doesn't seem right. On the other hand, of course, sometimes we do this, so we don't feel uh, any problems in saying that we force North Korea to perhaps open up or be more respectful of how they treat their citizens. So it seems that uh, with some countries, or, or to take a historical example, Nazi Germany, um, I don't think anybody would defend Nazi Germany. We would say that it was a good thing that the uh, allies in the Second World War, you know, decided to stop the practices that were in force in Nazi Germany and the uh, execution of millions of Jews and so on. This was a good thing that they went in there and intervened. But the question is, how do we decide which instance is which, right? So are there, there, there are some cases in which we want to intervene, in which we want to think that we know what is morally right, and there are other cases that are more difficult. And I think it, it becomes particularly more difficult if this is a democratic country, because then you can say, this is the will of all these people. And in the end, this is the only justification we have that is that we all can agree on, right? Yes. 
so yeah, you may think that because a decision is democratic, there is some kind of intrinsic value in this process that makes a decision okay and worthy of respect. You could think that, and therefore we should not do anything about it. But then there's two things. I think, well, first of all, I don't think intervention is necessarily wrong. Like you said, some forms of interventions are necessary and desirable. So that's one thing. Then obviously we need to determine when they are necessary. And that is when we hit the problem of relativism. Uh, and this is when a lot of dialogue has to happen and we need to like go through a um, very cautious evaluation of the kind of action that we're trying to prevent. So, so but that's one thing. I think intervention can be justified. But then um, I don't. I still think there's a difference between a direct intervention and simply a desire not to contribute to something, which is a form of you, you may say indirect intervention. You do affect the country's, um, you know, regulations, and they will have to take decisions. But you're not directly. Um, forcing them to do anything it, it becomes a little bit um whatever they decide to do after you refuse to participate is out of your control and you could argue it's not your problem anymore so i think in this case um it's also about the use you know the country will make of your product so for example, Pfizer could sell the same drug to the US if the US said, well, we'll use this drug for some other purpose that won't hurt people, but actually help people. But they could refuse because they're fully aware that the US is going to use it for something that they disapprove of. I think we would not have a problem doing that if it came to like guns, for example. We would not sell guns to a country if the leaders directly said we will use these guns to kill half of our population right but i'm afraid that there is a kind of bias there also that we tend to agree with some causes and not agree with other causes and it's difficult to find out exactly why we are doing this um, for example i mean the same drug that you can use to kill people in a death penalty uh, you can use to kill people for euthanasia. Yeah. Uh, and now you could ask, is there a moral difference? I mean, we tend, because we are, you know, um, left-leaning liberals, uh, we tend to think that euthanasia is generally a good thing as long as it's voluntary, uh, while we tend to think that the death penalty is not a good thing. And so we have this uh, emotional... Yeah um how you say pre conception or or pre judgment to favor uh, euthanasia over death penalty and so what now if the company the pharmaceutical company would say that we are a christian company we do not agree with euthanasia and we don't provide the drugs that are necessary for euthanasia although the government has decided that um euthanasia is legal would we then not think that this company is uh, stepping over the limits of what a company should reasonably be able to decide a company should should not be able to change the laws of the state if, if the state be, wants to legalize euthanasia i don't think that would be changing the laws of the state i wouldn't go that far the company would simply decide not to participate so for euthanasia, obviously the difference has to do with the will of the person impacted, right? Typically a prisoner uh, doesn't wish to die. Most of them probably want to live. And people who ask for euthanasia by definition want to die. So this is, this is how we make the difference. However, you could argue that euthanasia is wrong anyway. Uh, if you're a Christian company, you think euthanasia is wrong. I do think 
um, you, you should still have the right to do what you want with your product as long as you're not, I mean, it's a bit difficult because then you can think, oh, well, for example, let's say if we talk about vaccines again, let's say a company accidentally found a vaccine that, that you know, or a cure against COVID-19, but for some reason they are against the use of vaccines and they think it's immoral to vaccinate people and they don't want to share the vaccine with others. We would think that's problematic. Or as, as has been done in the past, that companies try to profit um, in some obviously immoral way from a shortage of a particular medicine. So they are the only producer of this medicine and then they decide to raise the price of this medicine and to take you know thousands yeah. of dollars for one dose of yeah. the medicine and then we would think that this is immoral this shouldn't be allowed because a pharmaceutical company is, is not only a company that can do what it wants with its product but this product is necessary for the well-being of others and uh, if a company deprives others of this then it is doing something morally bad so there are limits to the um yeah. power that one has over one's own things. Yeah, I, I think here it comes to the public use of the product. And it has to do with whether the, the product is going to be used for reasons that we consider good, um, you know, beneficial for the general public, how many people will be impacted, and is this impact going to be positive generally for society. So that's when we need to evaluate the action itself. And that's why now we need to evaluate it, whether death penalty is of, uh, you know, is beneficial for the general public. We could argue that obviously a certain drug would be, we could even argue that euthanasia would be beneficial for the general population. But do we think death penalty is this kind of good? It seems like we had this discussion before. It seems that it's crucial here to find out who the we is, right? So you mm -hmm. say we decide if death penalty is good. Um, but who is we exactly? So you could say that uh, in the United States, we should properly be the citizens of the United States. Yeah. And they have decided that death penalty is a good thing. Otherwise, they wouldn't have it, right? So mm -hmm. um, obviously we, we have at least to assume in the absence of other proof that death penalty for them seems to be a good thing. And uh, uh, now the company is depriving them of the medicine they need in order to do that good yeah. thing. Yeah, so it also depends on the way the decision has been taken, I think. I'm not familiar with the way laws are being picked in America exactly. I'm not very familiar with their democratic process. I know it's a democratic country. So I don't know. Let's say we had a referendum right now. I'm not sure what the result would be. Maybe it would be for death penalty, maybe it would be against. But irrespective, I think what needs to be checked is the way people come to take a decision collectively. If this way, if the structure of the decision making is fair, um, then yeah, it, it is a legitimate democratic decision and we probably should respect it in virtue of the respect we have for democracy in general, which could be questioned as well. But let's say we um, assume democracy is good. Um, but then if we find out that the process is imperfect, there's many interferences, people's will is not quite expressed or heard, well, then we can question the outcome. Especially today, this seems to be a problem because um, we know of all this influence of social media on uh, democratic processes and yeah. uh, how Facebook influenced or how how other companies uh, influenced uh, the outcome of elections in the United States and how they manipulate uh, citizens 
with what you know was called fake news um th there is such a thing as fake news right mm -hmm. and there is such a thing as this internet bubbles in which people you know reinforce their own opinions so if you talk of um, a democratic process that is not influenced from the outside and that works you know in an ideal way then probably we are not going to find this right nowadays oh there, yeah there doesn't seem to be such a thing yeah, uh, it's it's very flawed at the moment, and and the democratic process is being spoiled by a lot of different things. This is where we still have a lot of work to do, and I say we as members of democratic societies. Um, but it it doesn't really change anything. We still need to make sure the process is as pure as possible. So one other question that that brings us perhaps a little away from this um, question of interference in politics uh, and is a more genuinely moral question is what happens if now the people who are going to be executed um, have a choice and this was also in this guardian article there was this idea that they have a choice because the drug is not available now they have to choose between um the electric chair and being shot mm -hmm. and now there are multiple problems with this choice in itself right you can say there is a problem with even giving people this choice yeah uh, but perhaps you could also say that um depriving them from the drugs forces them to make a choice to be killed in a worse way so assuming that the drug works and assuming that the drugs provide um a painless and quick death which is not not sure to be the case right we yeah. we will talk uh, later perhaps about how this doesn't always work but uh, let's assume we have an ideal drug that is able to kill someone painlessly and quickly and but we disagree with the death penalty but now uh, by withdrawing this drug, we force these people to be killed in other ways that are more cruel and more painful. And um, actually we're increasing the suffering of these people while we could have reduced it. Yes. Uh, do you see that there is a more problem there? There is a bit of a more problem. There is a more problem, I think, in asking the prisoners this question in the first place. But I also think that, yes, here uh, the company is trying to do something that they consider morally right, but we end up in a worse situation. So it's a little bit like the argument for these centers where um, drug addicts can go and inject drugs under some supervision of doctors or nurses, right? right. So they're going to do it anyway. We may as well make sure they do it safely. So this is a little bit of the same thing. The US is going to execute people anyway. So maybe we should help in making sure they're being executed in the best conditions possible. Yeah, you can you can hear this argument. Um, so what is the problem? Like you just said, there's this other problem with the question itself that mm. we shouldn't be asking this question. Can you say a little what you think is the problem with that? Yeah, I am not sure exactly what the problem is, but it strikes me as cruel to be provided with this choice. Now, I can also potentially imagine a libertarian argument that would say, well, a choice is better than no choice. Um, at least I, I have this uh, last burst of, you know, will, uh, free will. So that could be a thing. But uh, to me, this is about almost an impossible question. It's very uh, anxiety inducing. It's um, torturing almost, you know, having to think about this. You're already in a very difficult situation. You know you're going to get executed. The last thing you want to do is think about how and evaluate what's best for you. I don't know if this is... Um, I, maybe you could say what you should do in this case is try to make sure the prisoner uh, has peaceful last days. Um, maybe, you know, often 
they're being provided with the possibility of seeing like a priest or maybe uh, doing a few last things that they'd like to do. Um, I don't know if the last thing we want them to do is choose the way they want to die. And also these two ways of dying are quite uh, terrible. I mean, being shot or being electrocuted. I mean, these don't seem like peaceful, painless ways to, to go, right? Yeah, of course, but this is the consequence of the previous decision to withdraw the drug, right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, they could have had a peaceful death if we didn't do that. So this is an argument actually in favor of not withdrawing the drug. It could be, it could be. Right. Um, um, I just think the choice in itself is, is, is problematic. I don't, I don't agree with this, I must say. Um, the, I mean, problematic, yes, but problematic, everything is kind of problematic. But I, I think it is a good thing to, to have a choice. So, for example, when I think about this alternative between the electric chair and, the, and, and being shot, I, I have a clear preference, right? I'm, I'm very much against uh, being fried uh, in an electric chair. I, I think that this is a is a terrible thing and it feels very unpleasant and it feels much less unpleasant to me it's a, it's a purely you know subjective i have no no idea about how it feels obviously uh, and i have not studied this I, I have no idea what the medical implications are but it seems to me um, that very clearly i would prefer being shot for some reason perhaps i would expect it to be less painful okay. or faster or whatever um, so giving me the choice, I think, is a, is a good thing. And then other people might have different opinions or different, um, different preferences. They might think that they, they're really afraid of guns and they prefer the electric chair, right? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that it's a, that there is anything, you know, that can be, can be rationally shown to be good in taking away this choice except perhaps reducing the anxiety that comes from the choice but isn't isn't the anxiety that comes from choosing a lot less than the anxiety that comes from the fact that you are going to be killed i mean it seems like this additional little bit of anxiety doesn't really make a big difference but it gives you a big a big difference in in control over your fate yes fair enough uh, obviously the anxiety is much less than the anxiety of just knowing you're going to die but um, so this is why I'm still not sure why it strikes me as cruel. Uh, it could be just a matter of sensitivity, personal preference. Uh, we don't want to base an argument on this. But um, I do feel like, to me, it would be an extra burden on my shoulders at a time when I, I, I'd rather focus on, I don't know, finding some internal peace. Um, yeah, and I may just have a problem with decision making in general, but um, this is also, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's something I should probably explore, but it does feel like an absurd situation. Right. So let's let's go a little more now into the philosophy of this um, thing itself, this idea that the government kills its own people perhaps before we go into the more detailed arguments for and against the death penalty it seems that this is the basic problem with the death penalty is that here the state is killing its own citizens yeah. and this seems to be from a, a social contract perspective seems to be problematic right that uh, this the state in the social contract idea is a voluntary um, association of people who agree to this association in order to further their own um, interests and in order to have a better life inside the state than outside. And now um, the social contract turns against them and forces them to be killed. Uh, it seems that this is a very basic violation of this whole idea of the social contract. Would you agree to this or is there any way to to save the death penalty from this accusation so yes and no i think um 
So uh, there is, from a social contract theory, uh, a way to save death penalty from that, I believe, because prisoners, let's say they're criminals, they, that's, they are guilty. They are what, what is called free riders, right? So a free rider is someone who voluntarily decides not to follow the rules of the, the social contract and therefore breaks the contract that binds them to the state. So this person no longer receives the protection from the state that someone else could expect. Because the person broke the contract, the state is no longer required to you know, also respect the contract. The contract does say that the state must protect its citizens, but in this case, it's over. So you could say, well, then the laws don't apply to this person, therefore we can kill them. We, so that's one thing, but then we need to agree on the kind of punishment that is acceptable from that perspective. So this is where we may, the, the original position of roles could be of value uh, in determining whether death penalty is an appropriate punishment. How, how would you use roles here to decide this? So roles came up with this idea of the original position, which is basically also an imaginary position, like a thought experiment, like the state of nature um, that is used as the example of the perfect situation to decide what the rules of society will be. So Rawls is a social contract theorist and he says that, well, basically we have to pick laws that are fair, right? That um, are just. So one way to decide what is fair, because Rawls refuses to commit to a particular conception of the good, meaning he doesn't have a moral picture of what a good society should look like. You know, he will never say, well, death penalty is wrong because killing people is wrong and it will always be wrong under any circumstances. Doesn't mean he doesn't believe that, but his fair society doesn't rely on any, any claim that is uh, morally loaded. So, he imagines this situation where um, people can pick the laws of society in the best way possible. So the conditions for that are that people must be unaware of their um, specific circumstances. It means they're not aware of who they are, what position in society, uh, what gender, the age, race, um, every contingent feature they may have, um, they're completely unaware of. Right. So, so when we decide about a law, right, we should decide like we don't know who we will be, right? This, this is the idea. So we, yeah. we are blind to whoever we are. So then we are not likely to have this bias, right, to benefit ourselves. Exactly. So you don't know anything about yourself. You only know a few things about the world in general the fact that we all live in the same planet, there's some resources that are limited, we need to share them. Um, some things are good, so roles call them basic goods. So things like freedom, equality, um, and then there's things that people need. We need to eat, we need to have a shelter, we need some kind of social life, you know. So these things are taken for granted, we all know them but we don't know anything about ourselves and our specific position in society. So this is what Rawls calls the veil of ignorance. So you're under this veil of ignorance. You don't know anything. So and how do we apply this now to the death penalty? How uh, can you try to make it a little more specific for this example? So like every regulation, what you're supposed to do is to place yourself under the veil of ignorance and decide of what you think is fair without knowing anything specific about yourself. So what Rawls says is that if you're rational, 
you will want to decide, you will want to pick something that would work in your favor if you were to be um, the least well off in society. So you will imagine that you're in the worst position possible and then you will pick rules that would benefit you if you ended up in this position, which is rational and, and makes sense, right? So two things here. Death penalty is a little different because as I said, if you face death penalty means you're a free rider, so the laws don't really apply to you anymore. So you could say, well, it's difficult to uh, pick death penalty under the veil of ignorance because you're supposed to pick regulations that apply to people who comply with the social contract. But anyway, you could also consider it as, you know, some kind of punishment that could happen to you if you happen to break the law. So um, you, do, you don't need to think that you're completely out of the social contract. You're no longer, you, you lose some of the rights that come with the social contract, but you still uh, maybe can claim uh, some rights. So you could decide, well, if I were in the position of being executed or like I have committed a series of murders, would I think it is fair to receive this as a punishment or in general, do I think it is fair to punish people this way? Um, so, so this brings us to this interesting question where we also seem to disagree. Uh, how bad is death penalty actually? Because if you consider that, uh, you know, like you said, I am under, under this veil of ignorance and now I know that I am a killer, I have, you know, killed multiple people, would I want a society in which I will be executed or would I want a society in which I'm going to go to prison for the rest of my life? And assuming that this is really for the rest of my life. So I, I know that I have, you know, multiple life sentences and, and with whatever uh, legal tricks, I'm not going to get out of the prison until I die. So now I am, let's say, 20 or 30 years old and I'm looking uh, into the prospect of another 60 years in prison. Um, and then I really have to decide, is it better to have 60 years in prison or is it better to have a quick and painless death? Um, and, you know, I think it's a, it's a difficult choice again. It's also difficult to, to have an intuition about what yeah one would prefer. Obviously, it depends a little on the prison system. So if you have 60 years in a Swedish prison, it's probably different from 60 years in a North Korean prison or a Turkish prison. So you would obviously prefer uh, one of these to the others. But um, even assuming that you have a prison system that is reasonably humane and works well, it is still a question if you would like to have 60 years in prison and this be your whole life or whether you would opt for, you know, let's just get it over with. Um, what do you think? I think um, many, some people would prefer to die. Some wouldn't. It's really difficult to tell. I, it's also difficult to imagine being in that situation and give you what your opinion would be. So I don't think we can know. And uh, yeah, there, there's room to argue that a life in a North Korean prison is worse than death. Absolutely. Um, I think it, the problem now is the, the value we attribute to life itself and whether we think that as human beings, we have the power to take someone else's life, something we generally consider as wrong. So we do consider it wrong for a reason, irrespective of the kind of life the person is um, living, right? Maybe the person is absolutely miserable. Uh, we still don't think it's okay to end their life, not because death would be worse, but because we just think it's not our responsibility. As another human being, we should not have to decide when someone is going to die. And I think that's the problem here. It's not about the quality of life 
what is worse, what is better. It's about what is in our power legitimately. So, so, so perhaps this brings us to another solution, which obviously is also difficult, but it seems if you if you say it this way, it seems preferable to say something like we uh, abolish death penalty, but we provide uh, voluntary euthanasia to mm -hmm. people with lifelong sentences so that the prisoner himself can decide, you know, or themselves can decide whether they want to end their lifelong sentence by opting for uh, euthanasia yeah. uh, for a voluntary death penalty. Uh, but this, of course, has the problem that now you stick them again in the position of having to make this decision, which you previously mm -hmm. said it's, mm -hmm. an, it's an inhumane and, and impossible decision. So what do you think? Would this be a good way of dealing with the death penalty, make it voluntary as an alternative to lifelong imprisonment? Um, so it's a very rational way of thinking of the problem. Then we would need to agree on the morality of euthanasia in the first place. What's interesting with death penalty is that we agree that some people should die, but we still do everything we can to prevent them from killing themselves. So we seem to have a problem with someone deciding to die. Um, at least we don't want to as assist anyone in this process. So mm, I don't it know seems what... irrational to to say both things, right? On, yeah. uh, before you argued that uh, it should be not anyone else's decision, uh, but now you say it should also not be the decision of the person who is actually. Uh, involved who is the but it is in fact what the subject doing. yeah so so then it would mean that uh, nobody can ever decide about the death of anybody including oneself so we leave it completely to chance right this yeah. seems to work out only if we have a belief in a god who takes things mm -hmm. in his own hands right because if you think that your life or or the moment of your death are determined by uh, some god who takes care of things then this seems to make sense but if you don't believe this if you believe that otherwise uh, the moment of your death is a matter of chance or disease or whatever can happen to you uh, then it would be cruel to take away this possibility from people to decide about yeah. it yeah it could be i'm not sure what i think about this argument i think it's um it's potentially a rational argument i think it could work it could be a little cynical as well uh, again it depends on what we think life should be and the, what the weight of life should be if we are completely okay with euthanasia i think we would have no problem with this kind of solution we, we do need to agree on this um, however what what life is or what life should be, um, for me, it has always been relatively clear that life has to be something that um, leads to some uh, kind of success or some kind of flourishing in life, right? Mm -hmm. You need some way for your life to be a successful life, uh, which doesn't mean, of course, it doesn't mean uh, material success yeah. or financial success, but it means some kind of life that contains a possibility of fulfillment as a life. Yeah. And if I know from the moment, uh, let's say I'm born, that I have some disease that will make my life miserable, uh, then I would think that this life uh, would perhaps have less value for the person who lives it um, but of course there are counter examples i mean people always then will will cite you know stephen hawking or, or people who have other diseases and then they manage to flourish despite this yeah. so this is um, a powerful counter argument to this but still perhaps for the average person um, having um, the prospect of a life in prison really takes away your possibilities of flourishing and therefore diminishes the value of life or, or don't you think so? I do agree that the value of life has to do with the flourishing aspects of it and how much well-being we are able to reach. And this, in this case, well-being can be defined in multiple ways. I, however, 
disagree with the fact that having some kind of impediment, uh, such as a disease or um, living in prison, has to completely um, take away this possibility to obtain flourishing. It maybe diminishes it if you compare yourself to someone else, but I don't think it's impossible. And I do think it is, life is anyway valuable because this possibility is always here irrespective of your um, circumstances. And that, yeah, that's maybe where we hit a point of disagreement because why am I saying this? Why are you saying this? I think it's, it comes to a, maybe just a personal view of things. I don't, I don't think it's a, it's a, even a disagreement. I think if you say it like this, then it, this gives us this, this idea of flourishing. It gives us a way to um, evaluate the circumstances of the imprisonment uh, rationally uh, and to say, you know, being imprisoned in a Swedish prison, um, even for life, is perhaps preferable to death because you still can find ways to flourish in a Swedish prison. You can, you know, read books, you can write books, you can do all kinds of other creative things. Uh, you can have a life that is still worth living yeah. while being imprisoned in a, in a Turkish or North Korean prison might not. I mean, I don't know. I've never been in one of these prisons uh, either. But um, let's assume, you know, you, you have this prototypical, you know, prison, uh, cruel prison in which mm. uh, you are tortured and you, you don't have access to books or, or writing materials yeah. or other uh, ways to pass your time. Uh, and, and in these conditions, then perhaps you could say um, this idea of flourishing gives us a way of, of evaluating the relative value of life in prison. And to say that in one condition, in one uh, situation, it, it is still better than death. In the other situation, it's perhaps it, it may be worse than death. Yeah, I think that's um, that's a good point. We should absolutely look at this. But also the argument for death penalty is generally not that death is better than a life in prison. So I agree with your point, though I don't think it really changes anything about the question of death penalty, because yeah, even if we agree on this, that is not how proponents of death penalty argue for death penalty. So let us have um, perhaps a brief overview over these arguments, what are actually the arguments in favor of death penalty? So you have the general arguments. Um, so the first of them is usually retribution. This idea that, oh, you know, of an eye for an eye, that you should receive something that is of equal importance as the thing you have done. So this is the idea of uh, making the punishment fit the crime. Now, if you if you look this up, the word retribution in connection with the death penalty, uh, then sometimes you find the argument that this is not retribution, it's vengeance. And vengeance is uh, bad, while retribution is good. Exactly. Can you say a little of something about the difference between these terms? Why, what is vengeance uh, as opposed to retribution? And how can we distinguish between the two? Mm. So I think vengeance, it all depends on what fuels the action. If retribution is something that is decided fairly in the context of a just society run by you know, proper rules of coordination and cooperation, we can then evaluate that this is um, justice and not vengeance. So it is not fueled by a desire to punish someone, to hurt someone, or it's not fueled by your own pain, like vengeance could be. It's, and that's why you need third parties and that's what we have in trials. We, we have people who are not part of the situation, obviously, um, which doesn't mean they cannot decide of something based on emotions. They absolutely can and often lawyers play with this. So, but we need to make sure retribution is justice and not vengeance. Vengeance would then be something that is a desire fueled by maybe hatred, which comes from hurt, um, which is understandable from a human perspective. 
but should not have anything to do with justice. So where exactly is then, what exactly makes retribution work, um, if not the emotion uh, that you get from witnessing this act of retribution? I'm, I'm wondering if there is anything rational in retribution at all that is better than vengeance, because you say, okay, vengeance is fueled by this strong emotion, you know, to, to punish the, the guy who did me wrong. But isn't retribution also, I mean, it is perhaps a little more measured, it is perhaps mm -hmm. decided by people who don't have this emotion, but in the end, it caters to the same emotion, right? If, if it was completely free of emotion, then we wouldn't call it retribution, we would call it prevention or something, if it has some other motivation. Exactly. So it seems that retribution always also has an emotional motivation. Yeah. So do you think that there actually is a rational retribution or is it all actually just another name for vengeance? I think the rational motivation for retribution could be linked to the consequences of the retribution. If we think that the consequences of death penalty are generally positive for society, then we have good rational reasons to prefer retribution. But if it's not about, so this is where we have to evaluate it from a utilitarian point of view. But then I agree that retribution seems to be, well, we, we probably base it on some kind of collective idea that killing people is wrong. And it, it feels so wrong to us that we think the only acceptable punishment for that is death itself. But in fact, this is the only thing we, um, this is the only time we seem to think that retribution is necessary. Like if someone, you know, steals a car, the police is not going to come to their house and steal their car. So we don't apply this principle for everything. We only do it for murder and for murder of a certain kind, the kind of murder that makes us literally sick, which is probably why we have this strong reaction, which is linked to our emotion. So I agree that there's not a, such a big difference with vengeance unless we only base it on the consequences. Right. So about the consequences, uh, this is also not very clear, right? There is this argument that uh, death penalty um, makes people more afraid of committing these offenses mm -hmm. that lead to death penalty. And then it has this uh, prevention aspect, uh, but uh, deterrence, right? That uh, yeah. people, other, other people will not commit the murders because they are afraid uh, that they will be killed. But this doesn't actually uh, seem to be very clear, right? From the data. No, it doesn't seem very clear. So there's two things about deterrence. First, there is the elimination of the threat of the criminal themselves, because they're obviously dead. And then there is the idea that people will be scared of getting caught, doing something really wrong, if they know they, they might die for it. But this doesn't seem to be confirmed by the data. Uh, when we look at the number of um, crimes in the states where there is death penalty doesn't seem to be much lower, which again doesn't necessarily mean anything, but at least there's not a significant drop in, in crimes, which um, at least doesn't allow us to affirm that it has this deterrence effect. We just cannot know. Right, but it's it's pretty difficult, right, to make sense of this uh, statistical argument because you don't know how the crime rates would be in these states okay. without the death penalty. So you need the additional assumption that they are all the same initially, and then you can say, okay, the death penalty, the death penalty doesn't make a difference. But it might also be the case that in these states where there is death penalty, the crime rates originally were much higher, which is what motivated them to introduce the death penalty. And then the death penalty actually lowered the crime rates to the levels we see now. So it is always very difficult to make these evaluations without having the comparison um, of the same state without the death penalty. Yeah, it's it's. Um, almost impossible. So as I said, we, we just cannot know. We have no evidence to, to go one way or another. We simply know that 
there is nothing that can um, allow us to say for sure death penalty works in and is actually stopping people from committing crimes. We cannot right. say that. Yes, and then, and then we have this argument that the criminals might have a right to life, and this right is something that we cannot take away from them. Uh, is this true? Does this make sense? What could motivate such a right to life? I mean, I can think of a religious motivation. Mm. Perhaps life was given by God, and we are not allowed to take it away. Um, but this seems to have various problems, right? The religious argument. One is, of course, you have to believe in that religion. Otherwise, the argument doesn't have any force. Um, another is that in the Bible itself, you know, if we talk of a Christian religion in the Bible itself, there are many instances in which uh, God takes lives of people, you know, destroys whole cities. So it's you can say, okay, this is God. This is not. This is not another human. But still. Um, it seems that um, the Bible itself doesn't show a very high respect for, for the lives of people. So how would you, what would you say there? Do, do, these, uh, do all people have a right to life that is unconditional or can this be lost depending on your behavior? So if we refer to the ontology, you could argue that everyone has a right to life and some kind of dignity because they are rational individuals capable of autonomy. And this you do not lose when you kill someone. You are still potentially rational and you still have autonomy. Your freedom may be taken away from you, but that doesn't mean you're incapable of making decisions and of um, you know, having some kind of free will. So okay, but but there we, we must mention now how Kant would deal with this, right? Because Kant um, would have this problem. This is a Kantian argument, right? To say that everybody is valuable because they are autonomous. But then Kant does this trick of saying that the criminal himself has, in his autonomy, justified that treating others. Um, in a way that disregards their dignity and autonomy is right for him because this is what he does as a criminal and therefore now we can apply the same rules uh, to the criminal the yeah. same rules that he endorsed by committing the crime and then this will be just because these are the rules which the criminal himself uh, embraced in the first place so to to just make it clear because this is a pretty pretty twisted argument right yeah. it would mean that if i uh, kill you then i am endorsing killing uh, as because i am rational uh, and and so i'm endorsing killing as something that is a, a rational response to somebody else and therefore by endorsing this i have also to accept that others may kill me yeah right so this is where we probably um could think of this idea of society in general having higher moral standards than those of a killer, right? So we tend to think, obviously, a killer has some kind of um, flawed reasoning. Or they don't value the same things. We don't, they don't value things we value. And therefore, we don't want to mimic a killer in the way we take these decisions uh, about them. So we may think that as society, we should still hold some values really high, irrespective of uh, who we apply these values to. So yeah, a killer, we condemn a killer for a certain behavior. We obviously don't want to be guilty of that same behavior. And the fact that the killer has broken that kind of contract doesn't mean we cannot set an example. And maybe as society, we should set an example. And you know, know better and be better. Yes. So, um, and then there's this other argument that it's uh, it, it also a problem, a specific problem with death penalty as opposed to other punishments is that it is not reversible. Uh, so we always have the, because we are human, right? We always have a probability, a, a perhaps low, but still a um, greater than zero probability to make a mistake uh, in the way we... Mm. Um, uh, punish people or in the way we uh, determine what their crime has been and we might actually execute people who are innocent 
And this is one of the more powerful arguments I find against the death penalty because it does not make any assumptions about um, retribution or about religious uh, background, but it just says that uh, everybody can make a mistake uh, and killing someone by mistake because it's not reversible is worse than putting them 10 years in prison by mistake because at least from the prison we can free them again but we cannot return them from death. Yeah. Uh, is, is this uh, something that you would think is an important argument? Yeah, I think it's a very strong argument. I think the, the possibility of making a mistake, it has happened, obviously, Rarely, but it, it does happen. Um, this possibility is worse than, you know, fairly punishing, fa fairly killing actual criminals, right? Um, it's worse to have worse to have one innocent dead than to have, um, you know, a thousand guilty not dead, right? Um, this is at least what I believe. So the the horror of killing an innocent outweighs all the benefits that death penalty could have of course uh, uh utilitarian would perhaps disagree yeah. right absolutely and but i'm not a utilitarian so right but let's say this clearly for for yeah. you know uh, yeah, those yeah, who are absolutely. listening that that you could um, a utilitarian would say what is the total sum of of uh, benefit or suffering that we are causing mm -hmm. and actually executing one person um in a way that is perhaps not overly um uh, torturous or traumatic, you know, executing them in a humane way uh, causes a relatively small amount of harm, um, while uh, having thousands of uh, criminals uh, in prisons whom we have to feed with lifelong sentences. This is also, it's also a cost thing, right? Perhaps uh, you have to guard them, you have to feed them, you have to um, uh, you have the risk that they may escape and and some of them may escape some of them may be yeah. um, freed uh, due to other mistakes in justice and then commit another crime uh, so you have all these risks and uh, it seems that at least you know we could think of of situations in which this calculation is in favor of killing the one actually right yeah you could think of that absolutely um this is not what i believe because again i'm not a utilitarian and I do think it also comes down to your how you value life and if you think life has some kind of sacred value that is higher than any other value. I do personally believe that it's about the responsibility and that no human being has should have this kind of responsibility or it's it's nobody's role to decide when someone else should die, irrespective of what they have done. I do think this is something that is not up to us to decide. Is it, you know, some God or is it simply nature or is it life itself? This I don't know, but I don't think it's other people's decision to make. And I do think there's a value, an intrinsic value in life that we should not take away from anybody, irrespective again of what they may have done. Um, and I also do think there is and that's another question, but there is a potential of some kind of, um, you know, a possibility to find some kind of internal peace, even after you've done terrible things. Uh, you could talk about redemption, but even without going into this very religious vocabulary, you can think that the, the possibility that someone may reach some kind of peace again is valuable enough to allow them this possibility. Right. Right. Okay, so we we are more or less now summarizing the topic. Uh, I know we left some things out, but you know, an hour is not enough to talk about everything. We didn't talk about the discrimination argument. Yeah. Uh, but just to to end it, uh, also, I would like to say perhaps that I I don't entirely agree with you that uh, that the act of taking the life in itself is so. Uh, morally relevant. Uh, it seems to me that what we have, uh, what we had talked about in between, the idea that life needs to be 
to, to have the possibility of flourishing is the mm. important thing. And so that uh, the death penalty in itself or the killing itself or the losing of life itself is less important than the question, how can we uh, give prisoners um, a way to lead a flourishing life uh, to perhaps um, have a second or third or fifth chance, you know, to, to get a life that is better than, than a typical life in prison. Um, and the death penalty then would be uh, perhaps an, a, a way of an exit uh, that is offered to someone who thinks that life in prison does not provide the conditions for flourishing for themselves right so so rather like a voluntary voluntary uh, euthanasia uh, and otherwise we should really put more effort into into making people lead lives in prison that are worth uh, yeah. leading and and that um, contain the possibility of flourishing yeah i think we can agree on that right okay so thank you next time we are going to talk about uh, violent ways of um, political discourse, whether terrorism is a good thing or can be justifiable sometimes. Um, and this will be next week, Tuesday. So uh, I hope to see you again for that. And okay. now bye-bye for me. Thank you and see you next time. Bye-bye, see you next time. Bye-bye.